can you hear me now? Good morning. God bless you. Welcome to Tag Church on the first day of the new year. You're already keeping your New Year's resolution. I appreciate that so much. I'm in church. So, kind of bittersweet, Joseph has taken his family to better accommodations outside the manger. They're gone. The new year is upon us, and uh, you didn't stay up so late that you couldn't come to church today, but this is what Dennis Stange posted yesterday or day before. I still don't know what I'm wearing to the living room New Year's Eve. I might not even go. Tyler Harrison posted last night, it's 9.15, I'm going to bed, Happy New Year to everybody. And Tyler's a young man. So I was able to stay up till 11 o'clock, uh, 12 o'clock uh, Eastern time to watch the ball drop, and then we went to bed. So thank God that we're here, that the presence of the Lord is here. His name is Emmanuel, never leaves us, he's always with us. Let's pray, ask God's blessing, and we're going to worship the Lord together. Lord, the scripture says you crown the year with good things. And certainly the last year has been a good year. And at the the, the crest or the cusp of the new year, we look forward to the great things that you're going to do. Lord, magnify your name. Make your name famous. Glorify your name Lord, and we want to worship you this morning at the very, very beginning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you stand? Let's sing together.
Just real soft. This is what God does. So, just a quick testimony before we pray. My wife and I are driving home last night and had an incredible. We used to call it a burden for prayer. I mean, it's an emergency, a crisis, a thing, okay? And we both didn't want to say anything, but we're both frightened. So I started praying, and she started praying. And in 12 miles, we were driving. In 12 miles, God answered the prayer. 12 miles. At 70-something miles. 80-something miles. 12 miles. A rush of relief. God silenced the fear. I want that for you. Anyone's afraid. Jesus, he, he's the calmer of that. He's the answerer of prayers. Twelve miles. I was reminded of when the disciples caught nothing and Jesus calls from the shore and said, Hey, throw your net on the other side of the boat. Twelve feet? Ten feet? Twelve miles is going to make a difference? Twelve feet is going to make a difference? This side of the boat, that side of the boat? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Jesus. In the name of Jesus. So I'm going to pray some Christmas cards t- today. A prayer for peace and happiness at Christmas. May the Lord bless you and keep you in the palm of his hands. Fantastic. Fantastic. May you find beauty and calm. Yeah. May his love surround you at Christmas and and always. Surrounding love, beauty, calm, peace, joy, freedom from fear. 
Let's pray. Lord, may the Christmas card prayers and the, and the promises in the scriptures, the examples and the true stories all kind of blend together in this service. Whatever we're dealing with, make peace and calm and joy and love, freedom from anxiety. All those things take place in this service this morning. You are a prayer answering God. And we don't pray to the wind. We don't pray to some fictitious character, some Christmas sentiment. We pray to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, to the living God who listens to his people when they cry. So we may be a little bit quiet as we cry today. And Lord, we're crying on the inside. Listen to me, Jesus. Answer my prayer. Lord, may you work through the seats, the rows of people here this morning and touch every single one of us because we need God. Jesus, Jesus, the darkness tremble. Jesus, you silence fear. Everybody. Jesus, Jesus, you can sing it quiet, you can sing it loud. You make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus, you silence fear. And once again, Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus, you silence fear. Can everybody say amen? Amen. Would you turn around and greet someone near you and say good morning, happy new year. God bless you. So nice to see you. Welcome to Tag Church. Won't get their visit here or their knee. They might not. I'll start. I'll start out with with a welcoming. The
Well, I hate to interrupt this lovely conversation, but I guess I'll do it anyway. Music to my ears. It's, it's terrible when there's just silence in the church. There's no life, no, no breath, no heart. So when people are talking, it's really, really good. Good morning again. Without Zach, Rhonda and I are doing the announcements just at least for the short time. And so we'll try to keep you in, involved and informed. If you are a first-time guest, I'm not sure if anyone here today is new, but if you are, we have a gift for you. It's a cup with a pen and a contact card and some candy, and it makes everything taste better. It's fantastic, and it's for you. You find these welcome gifts at the Welcome Center in the foyer after church. Welcome. And if you don't mind, please, if you are a first-timer, if you could find a card in the in the pocket of the seat in front of you, fill that out. We won't bother you. We won't harass you. You can just give us your email address. So we'll have a record of your visit. Appreciate it very much. Happy New Year, everybody. Happy New Year. Thank you for being here. I'm excited about all the things that will be happening in 2023 at Tag Church. So the first thing I have to tell you, pick up your worship guide if you want to. We repeat what's in this worship guide, and I don't know if it's necessary, but put it, you can hear it two or three different ways, and sometimes still forget. Um, there is no Wednesday night fellowship meal this coming week. Everybody give a big sigh. Yeah, uh. yeah that's sad. <laughs> it's kind of sad because Lori Russell is a fabulous cook and all of her helpers, but don't fear, January 11th, we are having Chick-fil-A for all of our volunteers. So most people in this church volunteer. So if you're new to TAG, find a way to volunteer. So we are going to have, um, his name is Jason, Jason Lansdowne. Lansdowne. He is a local owner and representative of Chick-fil-A. So he's going to come out and kind of talk to us about servant leadership, how Chick-fil-A does servant leadership. That is January 11th. But here is the deal, everyone. If you plan on attending, I have to know as soon as possible. And I for sure have to know by next Sunday. So if you've done anything in 2022, anything, then you're invited. Uh, your children will not be in the Chick-fil-A uh, gathering, uh, but we will have something for your children that night. But sign up at the, the Welcome Center, and please put out to the side how many in your family will be attending. Uh, also, I want to just say real quick, when I'm talking about food, we have a lunch for those new to tag on January 22nd. So if you've been coming since maybe the fall, you've never been to, uh, or maybe even the summer, and you've never been to a newcomer's luncheon, that's going to happen January 22nd. And starting next week, I'll have a sign-up for that. But I really want you to get to know our staff. Some of you, we have a lot of new staff, and some of you haven't had an opportunity to get to even know Pastor and I very good or our staff. So make sure that you sign up for that. So for everything else, please look at the worship guide or the bulletin and find out what's happening at TAG. I would like to make an introduction this morning, Josiah Bolt. And Josiah, if you'd stand, face the congregation and wave. Josiah's first day today is today as youth pastor. So if you're a parent of a teen, if you're a teenager or a college student, university student, would you please meet Josiah and Libby today after service? Please make yourself acquainted with, with him or them. If you have noticed or haven't noticed, we have these little reading guides for the sermon series. Sermon series begins today, a new sermon series called Restart. So make sure you get one. You can read along with us. Kind of be caught up to speed on what I'm going to be preaching on each Sunday in January. If the ushers are ready to receive the morning offerings, we are ready to give. So we'll pray and um, ask God's blessing. Lord, you have provided for us this past year. You have done wonderfully. 
You have blessed us. You've prospered us. You have protected us and helped us in every way. And so we want to thank you for that. We want to thank you for all that you've done for us. You are so good. We pray, Lord, that your goodness continues into this new year, that you will bless us, each family, Lord, spiritually, physically, financially, emotionally. Lord, surround us, as the Christmas card says, with your love and with your blessings. We pray, God, also that you'll bless the gift and the giver. May you prosper them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you as you give. Did you feel that? Something just happened that many of us take for granted. Another year is officially in the past. A chapter is closed. And now we look ahead to a new year. The mistakes, missteps, and missed opportunities of the past give way to hope, excitement, and joy for the new life God gives us. Pursuing Christ with each new dawn. Through His grace, we get the chance to reset the clock, to forget what lies behind and strain forward to what lies ahead. As we work, play, rest, and worship, we know His mercies are new every morning. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength, arriving at next year's end through His faithfulness. So whatever we do this year, let's give it to God seeking His will, trusting His plan, and taking this opportunity to restart. Which is the title of the sermon series I begin today. Restart. Everybody needs a restart. Body needs a fresh start. And the new year provides that. So, the reporter that I was watching on the news said that Southwest Airlines was, attempt, was attempting a restart or reset this past week when they shut everything down and thousands, it looked like, of bags were hauled off to warehouses, luggage, and the airline just kind of imploded and decided, well, we're going to ride this thing out. I don't know what exactly happened, but he kept saying, they just need a reset. They just need a restart. They got to do this thing over and reinvent themselves. And I think one of, Tony Nix, you were a victim of that, you and your family, that you were a victim of this, the Southwest Airlines debacle. So everybody needs to restart airlines, businesses, churches, families, and individuals. There are times that we just have to take stock, sit down, think, pray, get up, and keep walking. My father-in-law posted that this week. Sometimes you have to take a deep breath and just put one step in front of the other and get going again. So there's a famous Old Testament character that needed a restart because he got himself into a real pickle, as you're about to see. So if you have a Bible or electronic device, find 2 Samuel chapter 11. 2 Samuel chapter 11, we're going to begin with verse 1. We'll read through verse 5. 2 Samuel 11, way back in your Old Testament. Here we go. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, I guess that was the cycle back in the day. They had to wait for the things to kind of dry up or whatever and then head off to war. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab, his general, out with the king's men, an elite fighting force, warriors. David was a warrior. He sent Joab with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites. Wicked enemies of the Lord, Lord's people. He destroyed them and besieged Rabbah, their city. But David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. 
And from the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. And when the Bible says that, the Bible means that. And David sent someone to find out about her. So he did. The man comes back, and the man says, She is Bathsheba, or Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. So she's married. Then David sent messengers to go get her. She came to him, and he slept with her. The parenthetical statement in my Bible, now she was purifying herself from her monthly uncleanness. And she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word back to David, saying, I'm pregnant. My, oh my. How is David, the king of Israel, going to get out of this one? If anybody needs to recover from something, it's David. So this is one of the most shameful pieces of Old Testament history in the entire Bible. And we wonder how in the world things like this happen to characters of the Bible. I mean, I thought, <clears throat> excuse me, if you lived in the Bible times, then you were in the, a character in the Bible, you're always seeing God. And you're speaking to God constantly. God's he's in the Bible. You know, I mean, how, aren't they so holy in everything in the Bible? Aren't they so perfect in the Bible? Aren't they experiencing the power of God back in the Bible? Aren't they slaying giants with little rocks and surviving fiery furnaces and not even the clothes smell like smoke? Isn't that always happening in the Bible? And there's angels and Water's parting, and water's coming out of rocks, and there's fire, and clouds, and, and as for David, isn't he the honored poet, shepherd, warrior, king, <clears throat> that wrote the Psalms and led Israel during her golden years? Wasn't he the God chaser? The one who pursued God, the, the man after God's own heart, wasn't, isn't that him? And he's destined for the Lord for, to, to, for greatness and even the Messiah. Even the Messiah of Israel will come through his lineage and reign on David's throne. Come on. How did this? What happened? Well, the characters of the Bible and truth are very much flesh and blood. And someone said for all their piety, all their holiness, all their religious observance, they had feet of clay. It means they were imperfect. You know, they didn't walk around on six inches off the ground or whatever. Feet of clay. And I think we should never forget that. People of the Bible were just flesh and blood. And I'll tell you why. Because that's who we are. And things happen to people, you know, and you read stuff or see stuff online or someone calls you or texts you and you go, how in the world did he or she, what happened? Because people are people. And it doesn't give them an excuse. People get into all kinds of situations. That's why churches exist, as a matter of fact. Churches don't exist for perfect people. Churches exist for broken people. And you're, and you're looking at one of them right here. So never forget that the people in the, in the Bible, they're not perfectly sinless people except for the one. Of course. So there's two battles going on here, really. There's the battle out there in Rabbah, or in Ammon, in the field. There's a battle out there. But for David, there's also a battle right here and right here. It's a battle going on in David's mind. And see, Joyce Myers wrote that book, right? The Battlefield of the Mind. Maybe some of you have read it. 
But David never read that book. So he's having a war while he's looking at something he shouldn't be looking at. 99% of our spiritual problems begin right here. We tell ourselves a story. We lie to ourselves. We we justify things. We let something play a little too long in our head. And so the text reveals kind of the process of this battle that David's experiencing right here. First of all, he saw a woman bathing. Now, understand that David had the right to relax and take a breather from the stress of running a kingdom. It's an an incredibly different job. He's got to be a statesman, and he's got to try to judge things, you know. He's got to work with his prophet and priest, and he's got to discharge the duties of the king and govern the kingdom and institute laws and all, all that stuff. He's, he's, it's a full-time job. And he's got to run the, the army all the time. So it's, 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 in, it's within David's right to kick back, take a few naps for a few days, send Joab out, his subordinates, and go fight for me. I don't have to do everything. I'm the king. But the text notes, the text takes note that in the spring at the time when kings go off to war, David was not off to war. And so the implication is, anyway, the implication is that he was unoccupied. And when a man's mind is unoccupied, bad things happen. A man or a woman... Who, is not, who are not intentional about their lives, about their futures, about their path, about their, about their walk with Jesus. If they're not intentional, they're not on point, if they're not moving forward, taking one step after the other, if they're just kind of lying around, well, bad things happen many times. Intentionality is extremely important. Did you know I read that 41% of Americans will make a New Year's resolution today, but only 9% of Americans will keep the resolution? You have to be so intentional, so determined, so disciplined to lose weight or go to church or pray or read your Bible. By the way, let me shift gears for a second. If you have a Bible reading plan already in place, stick to it. If you're already fasting, please continue. But I have a challenge for all of you as well as for me. This week, I want to challenge you to read the book of Acts. The book of Acts is all about motion, progression, expansion of the church, missionary travels, the coming of the Holy Spirit, and the building of the church. It's all about movement. So I want to challenge you this week. Read the book of Acts. I think you could read it, the whole book in four chapters a day or something like that. I want to challenge you to walk a mile this week. Since the book of Acts is all about movement, if you're able to walk, some of you can't. Some of you, hey, Josiah, how many, how many miles are you going to run tomorrow? 20, 30? Josiah is so humble. Yeah. Josiah's going to run 20, 30 we could, One week, maybe we can walk a mile. I want you to share your faith or share the love of Jesus with one person. Here's some, just some goals for this week. Every week I'll issue a new challenge. Read the book of Acts. Walk a mile if you can, if you're able to. Go to Town West Mall, boring old rundown mall, walk the mall. Share your faith or share the love of Jesus somehow with one person. Dave is not intentional. So from his rooftop vantage point, he has the purview of the people down below, which is interesting. The Bible sometimes describes these opposites. He's high, Bathsheba is low. You know, sets the stage for us, his, his position. 
his vantage point. And you know, I guess he could not help seeing her. The woman is in full view, and I don't get that, but he didn't make her take a bath up there. She just did. And he got up from a nap, kind of, you know, not very intentional. Got from a nap, walking around, and there she is. Now, even though he couldn't help seeing her, he could have prevented himself from staring at her. And if you're taking notes, that's a good thing to write down. He couldn't help seeing her, but he could help staring at her. I want to let that sink in for a second. It wasn't a problem that he caught a glimpse. The problem was the long gaze. And something starts happening in here and in here. And men are like that, don't you know? He saw. And that starts the progression. Second, he sent. First he saw, then he sent. See, David, he had people that could do things for him. That's what's nice about being a king. I send my people to do this. I send him. I send her. I got people to do stuff. David had power, too. Whatever he said, people did. Because David could control people. It's another irony in the story. Because though he could control others, David could not control himself. He's high, she's low, he's in control, she has no control. He doesn't have any control over him. So I wonder what the first messenger was thinking when David says, Hey, um, uh, random question, Uh, who is that over there? And the messenger is thinking, well, he's probably going to tell that nice lady to stop bathing outdoors. That's probably what he's going to do. Uh -uh. And then the second group of messengers, what are they thinking? Well, he's probably going to discuss building a privacy fence so that these things don't keep happening. Oh, no. First he saw, then he sent, go get her for me. And then he slept with her. Some versions of the Bible say he took her. He took her, which is another poetic way of saying this ironic. He be- she belonged to Uriah, but he took her out of her covenant, out of her protection, out from under her umbrella, and took her because he could. Because something started here and started working here and here. And the thing just starts to unravel until the whole affair is out of control. So it's debatable, admittedly, whether Bathsheba was complicit in the affair. She knew that the palace was up there. I don't, but you can talk that over lunch if you want to, but make sure your kids are occupied with french fries and soda pop at the other end of the table. Was Bathsheba? Well, she conceived and sent word to David, and he realized that the chickens had come home to roost. So what began with the eye progressed into this downward spiral. How is David ever going to recover? How is he ever going to restart after this? There's a desperate attempt at a cover-up. He brings Uriah back. Hopefully to have relations with his wife, but Uriah is too noble for that. He's too noble. He's He's too much of a man for that. Principled, disciplined, warrior, soldier. So David tried to get him drunk, and surely the inebriation would take down the principles a little bit. But that didn't work either. And so the dark side of David's leadership is revealed next as this thing continues. 
And every reader of the Bible reads the truth of the Scripture that is unfortunately proved in the greatest king of Israel. And this truth is found in Jeremiah 17.9. And this is what the Bible says. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who really knows how bad it is? And David's living that verse right there. So Uriah is set up. He's taken to the front of the battle and everybody withdraws. And the archers from the walls... Bathsheba is brought into the company of David's wives. She bears a child, and the child unfortunately dies. The whole thing is really, really sick, sordid. Verse 27 says, The thing David had done displeased the Lord. What did Jonathan Edwards preach? Sinners in the hands of an angry God. Oh, God was torqued. Chapter 12, verse 1, the Lord sends the prophet Nathan, and Nathan reads David's mail and lays the whole thing out with a story. And at the end of the story, Nathan says, King David... You're the man. And David knew that he was caught so red-handed. So for all the good and the brave and the noble and the poetic and the righteous things David is known for, for the success and the peace he brought to his nation, the prosperity, the accolades of his heroism, Saul has killed his thousands. David killed his tens of thousands. All that. Listen to what the historian says about him in 1 Kings chapter 15. David had done what was right in the eyes of the Lord and had not failed to keep any of the Lord's commands all the days of his life except in the case of Uriah the Hittite. Hittite. That's how David's life is summed up by the historian. He did everything right. He did everything good. He did everything according to the Lord's will, except in the case of Uriah the Hittite. A defining moment, don't you think? That's the king's reputation. So here's a question for all of you to consider right here in church on Sunday morning. Consider this question seriously. Does an afternoon of fill in the blank ruin a person's life? I'll ask it again. Does an afternoon of fill in the blank ruin a person's life? David would pay severe consequences for sure. He would experience a lot of heartache for the decision that he made with this woman. And the sad truth is, we we learn this in grade school, choices made are choices lived with, boys and girls. That's what my wife used to say to her class. Choices made are choices lived with. It's true for a first grader. It's true for a 61-year-old. Yet, can a person ever recover? And can David move forward? So find the 51st Psalm in your Bible. Psalm 51. Psalm 51. And consider the heading of the psalm. This is what the psalm's heading, the description of the psalm, whoever put this together, this is what they wrote. Psalm 51. This is the, this is the prelude. For the director of music, A psalm of David. So David wrote this. A psalm of David when the prophet Nathan came to him after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. 
So this whole thing, once all the ashes, once the dust had settled, David sat down, maybe in his palace or in the house of God or somewhere under a tree, and the, I don't know, with the sheep, I don't know. And this is what he wrote. Have mercy on me, O God. Can a person ever recover? Can a person restart after a mistake and a tragedy and all this scandal? Have mercy on me. So I have a few things to say about this, and I'll wrap it up. Number one, I'm going to talk about the platform of forgiveness. I don't, know if, I don't know if I gave you guys. Yeah, I did. Okay. So if you're taking notes, I think this is important. Or try to remember it. The platform, the basis of forgiveness. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. See, here's the truth. We, flesh and blood, we fail God. We do things. We fail. God's love is unfailing. Can I hear an amen in the house of the Lord? A little louder than that, please. That's right. David appealed to God for forgiveness on the basis of the character of God. God is intolerant of sin. So don't think for one minute that God winked at the king and excused him simply because David's so cool and musical and writes hits and stuff like that, so charismatic. Oh, no. David knew better than that. So David decided to come clean with the whole thing and approach God on account of God's tremendous capacity for mercy, unfailing love, and compassion. God, it's just me here, and I'm only coming to you on the basis of your unfailing love. Thank you, Jesus. Where would we be without the unfailing love of God? Would you be sitting here right now? Number two is the petition of forgiveness. That's the ask. The petition is the ask. God, here's the ask. According to all this, okay. Okay, God, I'm asking. Wash me. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, verses 2 and 3. Psalm 51, verses 2 and 3. The petition. Wash me from all my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. And the wonderful thing about God is that's what God does. Number three, the person of forgiveness. Against you, God, and you only have I sinned, verse 4. He's the one we sin against. Naturally, you sin against your, your Bathsheba and certainly against Uriah, but ultimately you sin against God. You, your stuff isn't secret. Your stuff isn't unknown. My stuff isn't unknown. God knows. You're sinning against God. God. Number four, the power of forgiveness. Verses 12 through 15. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. God has restorative power in his resources to help David, to help you, to help me start again. God restores. God restores. God puts things back together. God puts things back into perspective. God allows us graciously to come to the throne of grace. The great power of God's forgiveness is in the restoration of the sinner. God has a way of making us whole again. That's what he does. God makes us whole again. And here it is in the New Testament. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all 
unrighteousness. <laughs> what? God purifies me from all my unrighteousness? Praise the Lord. And as for the wonderful thing that God did after David sought the Lord and confessed, it's found in 2 Samuel chapter 12. Oh, Lord, I hope I can find it. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 24 through 25. Can David ever recover? Does God allow a restart? Does God forgive sin? Does God make us whole? Does God, does God put us back on our feet? Does God allow us to take one step forward? Does God let us live our lives again after an afternoon of fill in the blank? Does God do that? If I go to God and confess my sin, does God put me back together? 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 24 and 25. Then David comforted his wife Bathsheba. I'm sorry, this is delicate language, but we're all adults, I think. I hope there's no kids in here. And he went to her, loved her. She gave birth to a son. And they named him Solomon. Solomon. Here's these dichotomies in the Bible. One son dies in disgrace. But God, in his mercy, gives them Solomon. The king who made wealth so common in Israel that they paved the streets with it. The Lord loved him. The Lord loved this child. And because the Lord loved him, he sent word through Nathan the prophet to name him Jedidiah. Jedidiah means this, loved of the Lord. Can God give David a restart? Oh, yeah. Does God wink at sin? Oh, no. Oh, no. But God provides a way for the sinner to come back to him, to be restored, and even, dare I say it, even blessed. God blesses him with Solomon. So God, in the mystery of his providence, overcomes the effects of sin and shame. And God never abandons his people or loses control of his purposes for them. And so we ask, was David's life ruined? Was God done with David? And did God remove the promises to the king? No way. Does God remove his promises to you? No way. David was forgiven. David was restored, anointed to rule in the grace and the mercy of God. The worship team could come. I'm going to stop. Just keep, just start playing, please. A couple questions for you. Have you let Satan convince you that something you've done is so wicked that God could never forgive you? Is anyone in this house this morning carrying this burden on their shoulder? Oh, no, no. God will never forgive me of that. That's a lie. God is a restorer of sin. God is one who puts people back together. God makes us whole. God forgives us. God has great grace and mercy. That's why we call it amazing. Does anybody need a reset? Does anybody need to push the refresh button? Right here on the 1st of January. Does anybody need to do that? I have one final scripture to read. It's found in Hebrews chapter 4, beginning with verse 15. 
For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Now, I am not saying that anyone in this church has done some wicked sin over the holidays. And even if you did, that's none of my business. But what I am saying is I think most of us need an opportunity for a reset. So while we sing in worship, I think Addie has two, two songs. I want to invite every single person in the house that's able to come. If you're not able to come, don't do it. I would like to invite every single person to the altars of God and just kneel and pray and think and talk and do business with Jesus on January 1st because this is the day for a restart. And God, God is able to do that for you. Can you stand? And can someone with the bravery of a David begin the process and walk forward? Can a man? Here we go. Can all of us spend a little time with Jesus?
just want to sit here at your feet caught up in this holy moment I never want to leave Oh, I'm not here for blessings Jesus, you don't owe me anything, more than anything that you could do. I just want you. And I'm sorry when I've just gone through the motions. I'm sorry when I just sang another song. Take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. And I'm sorry when I've come with my agenda. I'm sorry. When I forgot that you're enough, take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. I'm caught up in your presence. I just want to sit here at your feet. Caught up in this holy moment, I never want to leave. Oh, I'm not here for blessings. Jesus, you don't owe me anything, and more than. Nothing else, nothing else, nothing else will do. I just want you, and nothing else, and nothing else, nothing else will do. I just want you, nothing else. Nothing else, nothing else will do. I just want you. Nothing else, nothing else, Jesus. Nothing else will do. I just want you. Nothing else, nothing else, Jesus. Nothing else will do I just want you And nothing else And nothing else, Jesus Nothing else will do I'm caught up in your presence just want to sit here at your feet, caught up in this whole moment, I never want to leave. Oh, I'm not here for blessings. Jesus, you don't owe me anything, more than anything you can do. I 
I just want you. Lord, thank you for a new year. Thank you for a new start. Thank you, Lord, for the grace and the mercy of God. And we can live our lives in fellowship with Christ because you are a forgiver of sin. And Lord, even if none of us has sinned, thank you that we can come to the altar of God on the first day of the year and renew our our commitment, renew our, our love, renew our faith, Renew our passion for Jesus. Lord, may we live truly as God chasers, as David was known for. So Lord, we commit 2023 to you. May we discover more and more the great things of God. And may this church move forward. We pray for souls. We pray for people. We pray that we'll be able to make disciples, go on mission. We pray, God, that you will bless this church. We want to put you first intentionally. Live our lives for Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You are dismissed. Happy New Year. Josiah, if you could head out and just meet people on the way out. Everybody say hi and welcome. Out the void.